Hi and welcome to the Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. This is a bonus episode, the audio from a panel that I was a moderator for at this year's Minka Summit 2024 called How to Find and Renovate a Minka. So on the panel was Brett Rasmussen, who is a builder and community activist bringing together cleanups and uh, DIY projects where he's bringing old houses into use uh, in high demand for people on the island in Nagasaki. Uh, David Caprara, who is a journalist filmmaker uh, based in Nara, where he uh, fell in love with the area when he was there as a jet and many years later decided to take over an old property and Mark Benham, who is originally from the UK and now based in the Noto Peninsula in Ishikawa Prefecture. Luckily, his area uh, was, a lot of people had a lot of damage, but his particular house and area, they were okay. Um, But he talks about falling in love with the house and the area and how him and his wife have been trying to develop not only the house, but invite people from the local community to help revive it. Along that same community development thread, Sam Holden uh, has done interesting projects in Tokyo, uh, bringing back old Sento bathhouses, and in Onomichi, the port town in Hiroshima, where they are taking on old houses up many stairs uh, in a way to renovate the house, but also to provide services for local people in the community there. Welcome, welcome. Uh, How to find and renovate a minka is our title. We'll be starting soon. All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Is that okay? Um, I'm JJ Walsh. I do a little talk show called Seek Sustainable Japan. And one of our most popular segments of the channel is about makeup, renovating old houses in Japan. It's a huge market. Of course, you know that because you're here. And already reusing the old houses is such an important part of a better future. So really excited to introduce these four speakers today. A question already? Wow. <laughs> so we're going to dive right in. We're going to start with Sam Holden. Now Sam has done a bunch of interesting projects around Japan, including Sento renovation, bathhouse renovation in Tokyo. A really amazing project in Onomichi, Hiroshima, where I am, so I'm a bit partial to that way. And we're going to start with Sam. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so I'm Sam Holden, and I think maybe some of you might have been at the panel on Friday. So uh, let me just repeat my um, self-introduction here that I gave on Friday as well. Um, I came from Denver and uh, spent a year in Niigata when I was in high school. And I've been in Tokyo for about 10 years. Uh, I worked as a translator in Tokyo. Uh, and for the first three years I was in Tokyo, I was actually at graduate school studying vacant houses and how they're being reused. And when I finished graduate school, I started to renovate houses myself. Um, so my work, uh, which I, I'm um, going to talk about today, it really, my, my main focus or interest is in sort of how to use vacant spaces to create new kind of urban commons and places for people to gather. Um, so I have these three projects here, two of which are in Tokyo, Tokyo Little House and Yunani Yunagaya. Um, but today's panel is about how to find the minka and renovating it. So I'm going to talk about my project in Onomichi, uh, which is called Labyrinth House. Uh, and this project is something that we've been working on since uh, 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, these houses are uh, we're basically doing a full DIY design and rebuild of two houses, built in 1919 and 1938, and a warehouse. Um, And we received these houses for free. Uh, So I'll tell you about how that happened in in a minute. Um, The thing about these houses, though, is that there's no car access. You have to climb 150 stairs from the nearest road to get to them. Um, So it's a difficult process of uh, renovating them. 
Um, and we're turning this second house that we're working on now into a general store in the library. So we're trying to create sort of a space that functions for the residents of the community. Um, anybody been to Onomichi? Yay! Yeah? I realized on Friday that oh, some people don't know where Onomichi is, so I included this map this time. It's basically about an hour east of Hiroshima City. Uh, it looks out over the Inland Sea. Uh, and it's a, as I just mentioned, it's a hillside town. So you could go out of the station, and within a 15-minute walk from the station, you have this big slope. Uh, and there's about 500 houses on that slope that are vacant. Um, so what's happened in recent years, of course, is that a lot of them are decaying like this and falling apart. Um, but you also see a lot of people coming in uh, and renovating spaces into new businesses, into houses to live in. Um, and since the mid-2000s, it's been a nonprofit organization that's kind of been uh, at the center of all of this, uh, building sort of a community around renovation culture. Uh, so I would say probably about 100 spaces on this hill have now been um, uh, renovated into things like bakeries and cafes and shops and houses. Um, and you can see even, like, one of the migrants in town is a manga artist, and he wrote this book about the whole uh, community. The name, the name of the book is uh, Find a House with Zero Yen and Escape Tokyo. So there's sort of a, there's a, there's an Onomichi dream that we talk about in Onomichi, which is you find the house for free, and you renovate it yourself, and you get to make a little business or something. Um, so that's what brought me to Onomichi. Um, now I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we found our house, but first I'd say the most common way to find a house in Onomichi is you go to Akia Bank, and maybe if you're looking for houses elsewhere in Japan, you'll find a lot of communities have Akia banks. Um, so in Onomichi, the process is you go to the nonprofit organization's headquarters, they kind of have a list of properties that are listed, some of them will rent for maybe 10,000 yen a month, some of them you can purchase, uh, and they'll give you advice as well, they'll say this house is good for this, you might want to watch out about this. Um, and most of the properties on there are in pretty good shape, so if you, if you, don't, you, know, if you don't have a whole lot of experience, doing the Akia bank is, is a good way of doing it. Um, we didn't find our houses through the Akia Bank. We found our houses through word of mouth. And so the other way you can find a property in a place like Onomichi is by making yourself known in the community for a while and waiting for people to tell you about things. Um, so I and my, my, my friend who is working on the project, we started going to Onomichi in 2015. Uh, we found our houses in 2019. Uh, and then we transferred the deed uh, after renovation began, so 2021. Um, the way we found the houses actually is interesting. So in 2018, there was a big uh, rainstorm on the hillside in Onomichi, and it knocked down a lot of the, some, some of the houses. Some of the walls of this house were quite damaged. Um, our friend who was living next door, uh, he had been putting letters into the mailboxes of the empty houses and saying, if you want to get rid of this house, send me a message. So this, this rainstorm happens, and the old owners who were living in Hiroshima City at the time, they come back and they see all the damage. They say, oh, this is terrible. What are we going to do? And they see the letter, and so they call him. And for them, it was a great thing for them to get this off their hands, because uh, if they were to have to destroy it, again, it's up on the hill, so it would cost several hundred thousand dollars to destroy it. Um, you have to carry everything down by hand. So they were happy to give it to us. Um, so great, free house, right? Interesting thing is, it actually, you get, a, you get taxed on a free house. Um, so there's a gift tax of 10%, and this is, this is done based on the official value of the land. The official value of the land in this case was 4 million yen. So we thought, this is kind of silly that we're going to have to pay 400,000 yen of tax on a free house. Uh, so someone we talked to said, oh, you just split the house five ways, and then there will be no taxes, because it will be, uh, it'll be under the, the, um, the limit for the taxation. Um, so I am now the one-fifth owner of three houses, is the way that you should... Um, <laughs> Um, and, but it's, 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 it's okay for us because we don't think of this as an asset, right? It's just ownership to us doesn't really matter on paper because the house doesn't have any value, so to speak. Um, so this is what we're building right now. We're building a um, little shop that'll sell daily necessities like toilet paper and soy sauce and then have a weekend cafe uh, and a residence upstairs. Um, so now I'm just going to, before, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm just going to show you briefly uh, the process of how we re are renovating the second house. So we already renovated one house in 2021 and uh, 2022, and since 2022 we've been renovating the second house, which is going to be our shop. Um, so this is what it looks like at the beginning, a uh, totally collapsed uh, uh, floor, um, very strangely built additions, lots of stuff inside. So start by stripping everything out. Uh, down to the foundations. Um, this is important. So one of the first things we did is we renovated the second floor and put in new tatamis and a new ceiling so that we can actually sleep here while we do construction on the first floor. So we've been living in the construction site for the last two, two years. Uh, we always live in this eight-map room. 
Um, but when we were building the first house, we were actually living in another vacant house next door. So there's lots of vacant houses, and you can kind of move around as we're, as we're renovating. Um, so we stripped out uh, everything here. This was our toilet. We were using it like this for a while. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, had to replace uh, roofs. Uh, one area of the house was very damaged by rain, so we had to uh, knock it down and rebuild it. Um, so this is after demolition is also complete. Um, I just mentioned, so at the bottom of the hill, uh, we're 150 stairs up. So every time we get wood, uh, we get our lumber guy to deliver wood to the bottom of the hill here, and we call our friends up at 9.30 in the morning, and then we carry it up the slope, like this. Um, this is the this is a five meter beam, which actually doesn't even it's not even possible to rotate it completely in some of these alleyways up on the hillside. Um, so we we rebuild the structure like this. Uh, rebuild the front of the house where uh, we had to destroy the um, roof. Uh, also, of course, not only did to bring everything up, but this is all of our trash from uh, demolition. We have to take it down, so we make a little slide down the hills like this, <laughs> uh, slide it down to the bottom, use these little carts and things. This was like a week-long process, just getting the trash out. Um, and then, yeah, we're basically lifting up the building in different places, putting in pillars and such. Um, we do use professionals sometimes for things like plumbing, um, and we call the roofer to help us put the tiles on the roof, but he came to see the roof and he said, oh, you guys are doing this all yourself, why don't I just give you the tiles and teach you how to do it, and you can do it. So we did the, we did the, the tiling of the roof together, uh, put in some skylights. Um, so then it starts to come together. This is a last fall, we're starting to see the space come together. Um, new structure. Pitfalls. Um, yeah, you never know what's going to happen with a Ninka. So um, we were digging a hole outside the kitchen to put a new uh, sewer pipe in. Uh, and the hole we were digging started to just cave in. It was just empty inside. We heard we heard plops of water down below. So we, we stuck a flashlight and a camera in. And we found uh, right beneath, directly beneath the wall of our house, we found a five meter deep one and a half meter wide well uh, that had been there, and then at some point in the 1960s, they had decided to just put a top on the well and expand the house over it. Um, so you can see in the picture on the left, we're, we're shrinking the size of the well and trying to fill it in, so that's been another process that was quite shocking. Um, I buy fittings like this on uh, Yahoo Auction or online and get them sent to me, so these are from Fukushima. Um, build it build the house around the fittings that we were able to find online. Um, and we're just about at the end of the process on the second house now. Um, so this is the last little slide I'll show you here. Um, but you can see the house is really coming together at this point, and probably by the fall we'll be ready uh, and done with this. So last slide. Um, I'm just going to show you uh, costs of this. So the houses were free, right? Um, the other thing, uh, about a thousand days of volunteer labor have gone into this over 26 weeks. Uh, that's both houses, not just the last house. Um, so the main material, the main costs that we're paying for are materials, food, beer for all the people who help us. Um, and so we've probably had about 100 volunteers come in during the pro uh, project and I, we pay for their food and everything as part of the project. Um, but uh, the first house we did for about or less than five million, and on the second house, all the construction that I just showed you, that's cost about three million yen so far. Um, so we're able to do this project very low cost because it's all volunteer DIY labor. Um, and yeah, that's that's it. Uh, the other thing, my colleague uh, Akihiro Yamamoto, he's on the project. He's writing this um, series on, online right now about what to know about buying a Akia in Japan, and it's actually very good information, the, not just the good things, but the pitfalls and the things you got to be watching out for. So any of you who are thinking about it, look at this uh, article series. So I'll pass it off to the next. Thank you very much. Mark, you going? Okay. 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 I'm going to ask, yeah. Uh, pull the cane out when I'm uh, over, over the time. I'm, uh, I okay. need to practice the time. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, our next speaker is David Kapara. He is a trained journalist, uh, documentary filmmaker, 
He started as a jet, did a U-turn sometime in America, came back to the same beautiful area, and bought a house. And uh, also did a documentary, really interesting one, which was featured by NHK in the same area he's living. So really excited to hear from you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Me too. Um, yep, so as I said, I'm a journalist based in Nara. Um, I was working in New York for several years with Japanese media, um, NHK, Japan's public broadcaster. And I was kind of dreaming about this Minka movement. I was online kind of looking, thinking of like alternative ways to live. Uh, I found communities um, in Chiba Prefecture and other places that really inspired me. So with the attitude of, you know, any, I wanted to continue with journalism, but really this era where if you have an internet connection, you can bring your work with you anywhere. I was very inspired by that. And I met a lot of people um, experimenting with that in very interesting ways in Japan. Um, not a lot of uh, breaking news out in NARA, um, but slow news, documentary, and uh, kind of more well thought out news. Uh, yeah, we, me and my wife both uh, are filmmakers and do journalism. I kind of use my Minka as a hub for traveling all around the Asia Pacific region. I was with uh, CBS News' Tokyo Bureau before they closed down uh, entirely two weeks ago. Uh, there's no more Bureau. So, uh, uh, yeah, but I'll tell you about this story. This is uh, last year uh, that had this. And uh, I was a part of this. Um, a, a little, so the other presentation I was asked to be a part of was about honoring traditions. So I, I, that I was uh, not, not a part of, but I included some of that in that. So uh, yeah, so my number one advice, more than anything, um, I'm not going to talk too much about finding a minka. I had a very easy process of finding it on an Akia bank. Um, I think finding a minka is not very difficult. I think determining why you want to do it is the absolute most important thing. And to really think it through, like what's your goal and what's your intention. Um, you know, is, is it to, and uh, they often say that, like, think about the way things work in your home country. It's generally the complete opposite in many ways. So you're not going to save money on rent uh, by doing, I was paying Ichimon in a month before I bought this Minka. Uh, I mean, if you do the math, uh, you're not going to get financial investment on that. They say that, you know, uh, houses here, once you take them off a lot, it's like a car uh, where it's only going to depreciate with the declining population. I think that's going to change, looking at all of these beautiful renovations that people are doing. Um, but yeah, the way that houses accrue equity in the United States, for example, um, it's not much of a thing here. Um, another thing is, you know, social programming. Like, oh, I'm not successful unless I own a home or, some, or something. I mean, Minkas are interesting because they, they offer you a very cheap way to tick that box and to uh, tick that box and realize you don't know anything. You know, you, you enter this world naked, you leave, you leave naked. Uh, is you know buying it is I think in throughout Asia Japan people are much more understanding of uh, you know owning something is not this uh, this great you know you don't own anything you're owning responsibilities and you have to look after this place and you have to be a part of the community uh, but for me a big motivator was it uh, of, of my life as a journalist I you know I survived yesterday you know I'll probably do a lot tomorrow but as far as what next year has in store next year my work is kind of month for month very different. Um, the traveling all around Asia and the uncertainty in that to have a, a kind of a rock of stability in a place that I love um, was really important for me. Uh, retirement home, you know, I think that's a, that's one category of, that a lot of people fit into here. Uh, my biggest advice with that is, you know, look at your communities and imagine what it will be like in 20 or 30 years. And, uh, you know, I was a part of this local uh, gathering with um, the, the people in my village the other day. I was this young, this new young guy moved in, uh, 62 years old. I was, I'm the only person at this meeting under the age of 60. Um, so yeah, I mean, these villages are going to drastically change, um, and that's something to keep in mind. But you know, new opportunities. Uh, I, I really, des I describe this to people as kind of the new hippie movement. I mean, this is a new counterculture movement um, that's I've never. You know, we're all doing our own things under under these rocks, but this event kind of brought all us weirdos together and share about what we're doing, um, and it's amazing. No go farming is uh, another thing people consider. Um, but my method of life is kind of following like, go in and things that you're attracted to. I mean, I've been obsessed with this for 10 years. I was, I've lived in this area for, um, I first came 12 years ago as a jet, um, as I mentioned. And I went to uh, this TED talk in Kyoto. Um, some guy named Alex Kerr, uh, I don't know who he is, I'll give his talk, and it completely changed my life. Um, I was like obsessed with it. And like I'm off in the candlelight, it's like I must get at me. Uh, so uh, yeah, I did. for better or worse, um, here I am. Um, so uh, another big part of advice is get to know a place. So my situation, I've been connected to this area for 12 years, uh, but you know, 
that's not something everyone can do, um, you know, especially if you're living abroad or something. But even so, try to meet locals and like build a, what's known as a futasato, like a hometown connection. Go to Matsuri, like meet your neighbors. This woman, as Yamatani-san, she was living up in this very high... Um, so there's a system uh, that I used to help volunteer with where they would collect vegetables from these old obachans that, uh, and we would take the vegetables and sell it in the market once, once a week or once a month. And I volunteer every now and then with that. Um, yeah, just choose like 90, 96 years old, I think. I don't know. But yeah, really uh, interesting people. Uh, where to look? You know, people mentioned word of mouth, um, just kind of connecting to a community, meeting with senpai here, or maybe people have advice. Um, I, I don't have much to offer in terms of that because I, I'm really of the mindset, like, if you put your antenna off, what you're looking for, you're going to find it. Um, this is uh, the house that I bought last year. And I, it's not a uh, Kominka uh, in terms of being 150 years old. Um, it's built in 1957. Um, in, uh, yeah, 1957. And it's kind of a handshake between traditional Kominka building structure and newer building, building uh, ideas. But the Daiki sign who made this and the, the, the building methods, um, they used the uh, you know best, best, best people in the area, best resources in the area. And uh, yes, so this photo is from several, like a year or two after it was built. And this is the area. Um, the house came with um, quite a bit of farmland. Um, and that's one thing with regulations, um, I think maybe we'll mention here that a lot of, it's not a country law is my understanding, there's local municipalities have their laws about who can bargain uh, farmland, who can't. A lot of places, even if they have strict regulations and you're not a farmer, if you have some kind of interest and intention to at least like look after it, uh, they will work with you a lot of the time. Um, this is uh, some pieces, pictures of the interior of the house. That's my wife pretending when she plays guitar. Um, Wonderwall, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the best. Yeah. Um, that's her area. She uses an office. There's like a Hanade area in the, in the back. That's at Alex Kerr, Yobu. He came at that at an event. Um, sake was probably involved. This is the Zasuki area. Um, but if you, as you, so you go in, and, and this building is not from 150 years ago. This is not an Edo Jedi building, but uh, this one carpenter in the area. So this is a, a Shin Kominka, like a new, a new old house. Because uh, you know, one day Showa will be 150 years old. And when you walk in here, the way that it's preserved, I mean, you kind of feel like you're you're, you're slipping back in time to a different era. And uh, I've kind of fallen in love uh, with the, with the house um, since. Uh, like Christmas lights, and uh, I mean, the one thing that is really nice in that, just like moving in to an Akia, communities just like seeing houses lit up after being dark for years, they get so excited to see people. And uh, you know, there is like an apprehension of outsiders, uh, but it's, I think that if you put yourself out there and make yourself open, um, you will quickly make friends. This is my area I use as an office. Um, not quite sure what the use of this room is. It's kind of turning into a dining room. Yeah, it's where I do some work. This is a. Uh, this is the where it, it's very cold uh, in the winters, and uh, some, this is where I like like a cat sit in the sunlight and try to get warm. Um, I am of the um, Italian descent, and I uh, recently found a recipe book from my great grandmother, her biscotti recipe, recipes from Italy. So I took those recipes. So my biggest advice is like your self introduction. And you got one chance. Like when you meet your place, just like it doesn't need to be anything special, it, uh, but just like even the smallest thing, just like meeting your neighbors and saying, hi, like I just moved in. And, like that changes everything, like getting to know their, their names and everything. So uh, big advice is like trying to uh, just say hello and meet whoever you can. Um, Another thing is to honor, you know, the ancestors of the house. These are not just buildings and properties. Um, you know, this is your, I, I view this as carrying the, the baton. Like you're, you're, you're catching the baton from these forebearers, and you might not be the descendants, but I think you can still respect them. Um, so I'm actually a, 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 I don't throw the word monk around lightly because uh, you know I, I work, and, but I am a registered Shugendo Buddhist monk. Or Yamabushi is another word for it, and this is me and my teacher uh, performing a house blessing ceremony where this is like the Buddhist version of uh, popping a bottle of champagne and saying, here's to the next hundred years, but also uh, respecting the ancestors that lived in that house before. Um, so they did a uh, ceremony like that. Um, so my house did not require a lot of uh, repairs, uh, like 
uh, the, the roof's in good condition. A lot of the rooms, um, I haven't done anything huge, but the house was completely filled up with uh, stuff. And the previous owners, there was two brothers who, the first chance they got, they grew up there, the first chance they got, they left the Inaka and they never came back. They left it running. Um, and this is a, a common story. The parents lived there, parents passed away, and they didn't really know what to do. They're paying taxes on this. So they decided to sell it. Um, but it was this perfect situation where they, like, they're like, wow, like, this foreigner wants to, like, it cares about this area. And, like, he's like, and, uh, we don't <laughs> really want to get out of here. But, um, but it worked very well. I mean, it was very mutually, very happy about every angle of how this went down. Um, but the house was just filled with stuff, and they, they had hired a move, uh, company to throw everything out. Um, and before they gave me the key, um, they basically uh, said, come in by yourself, here's your key, you can borrow it, post-it notes. And this is something that um, you know some people have the experience of doing. You might want to try to negotiate yourself if it's a similar situation. But I just put post-it notes, so like signs that said show booth on things to, that, that I definitely didn't want to throw out or keep on the post -it. Um, and just put it on everything. And I found uh, some pretty incredible stuff. One is this record player that I'm uh, very happy to have fixed and is now like, Bluetooth uh, playable and uh, um, all kinds of old newspapers. Um, here's a Ford ad. So, so for some reason, the house that had these newspapers, the Showa Ninen, which is 1927, a lot of newspapers from that era, I don't know why, but to preserve, this, uh, to preserve what were treasures um, that they wanted to preserve, they wrapped things in this junk newspaper but a hundred years pass, and this junk becomes like this, like this, like Model T advertisement, and it's like these, like hundred-year-olds. Oh, like Kadeki Kojo. Is, and so here's one of um, the, the treasures: is uh, these are these bowls from uh, Wajima, uh, this area that was uh, affected by the earthquake. I think you all know. In New Year's, um, uh, maybe you, some of you know, some of you don't know. It's very famous for its uh, Urushi lacquerware. Um, so there, uh, we have a lot of that inherited. Uh, traditionally, a lot of Japanese people will, will whip this out like once a year, special occasions, and then it doesn't really see the light of day. But actually, to take care of it, preserve it, you should be using it and washing it. And uh, so that's what we intend to do. Our um, meals are not always traditional. I think the first one was a like shrimp gumbo, um, <laughs> but it was good. Yeah, and the bowls seem to enjoy it. Um, two minutes. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, hanging scrolls. Um, this is a picture of the owner uh, that I bought the house from and his mother. And um, I found these photo albums and I said, you need to take these. And they explained to me, in 20 or 30 years, I'm going to be gone and, I, and someone else is going to be hiring a moving company to throw this out. I would, like, as a journalist, if you can make use of this and take your, your stories, please do. Um, so I, I do it. I found some really uh, great pictures. A lot of these are like 100 years old. These are like all girls school in Wakayama. These were in... Uh, just amazing. I'll try to respect the time limit last through, but really great quality photos. This is the brothers, the two brothers, the guy at the Akia Bank in the middle, and uh, the um, invite the mayor over. But the, the five minutes before I headed out for for this uh, this event, I was late because the mayor just stopped by my house without <laughs> notice. Like I got something to talk to you about. He's like I want to come in. It's like oh man, but uh, so we did. Um, and another big uh, advice is don't be afraid of ghosts. So uh, people, a lot of people in Japan are very superstitious. I don't even believe in ghosts, don't believe in ghosts, whatever. If, I don't know like what you believe, but I, I think that rather than being thinking that there are these boogeymen trying to like, scare you and get angry at things, how can you honor their past and honor the tradition and, and pass things forward in a way that if there were ghosts, it would make them feel very thankful that, that, that things are being passed on. Um, that's how I feel if I was a ghost. This was a, uh, a Native American, uh, uh, this is a ghost dance to honor, what's, you know, in English language they call it ghost dances to honor uh, ancestors, and apparently this really freaked uh, the uh, colonial colonists out to see these uh, ghost dances. I don't, I don't find ghost dances it's scary. I, I dance with them. They're uh, my friends. Um, so balance, ask your partner what they think. You know, don't just get level-headed and think about yourself. It's a big thing. You know, what kind of life you want to live. And pay for it. Um, this is from one of the frogs. His, his message, we have these little tiny tree frogs all around the house. And uh, Michelle, uh, who gave another presentation here, she said, frogs are like the manifestation of peak consciousness. And I totally agree. They just like sit outside all day and just like watch the world go around. And, uh, so uh, enjoy. Good luck. Thank you very much. Mark uh, did a presentation with his amazing partner, Mihai, the other day. 
Uh, they are based in Noto, which was affected. Luckily, their house was, was okay. Um, but they have really done some creative changes in their house. And so very interesting, more artistic, creative approach to finding and renovating a minka. Looking forward to it. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, okay. Uh, so my name is Mark, and I uh, am a Shinko I guess. Uh, uh, relatively newer house, I guess, but in design, built like the old, old houses. And uh, with my wife, who is just sat here, and uh, she is the real brains behind what I want to show you today. So uh, I have uh, one, two, three, four, five different uh, projects in the house that uh, have I renovated, and I want to show you some pictures and talk about this. Um, before I talk about this, I really want to emphasize uh, the kind of person I am. So, uh, like, I am a humanities person, like, I'm a linguist, yeah, I like theology, and philosophy, so I have spent my entire life talking, to, like, talking, and never touching a hammer. <laughs> so, I came to Japan, and uh, me and my wife, we, we, we got a house, and my wife is a dreamer, <laughs> and uh, she dreams big, so, uh, well, <laughs> This is this is the point. Uh, if we wanted to manifest these dreams and we paid a professional to do it, none of them would exist. So I had to learn the skills, and these are the results of the skills I had to learn. Okay? So, um, if you have never done any kind of DIY before, I am testament to the fact that you can learn. <laughs> and if you have someone telling you to do it and a bit of YouTube skills and some friends you can talk to, uh, you can accomplish some truly incredible things. And I, I hope you see that in some of these pictures. Yes, well, let's let's see. You, you can decide if it was okay or not. Okay, um, okay very first thing I want to talk about. Um, discoveries. You can discover some kind of incredible things in your house. Uh, so, um, our living room. So, um, our house is very big. And uh, the way that um, we have designed our house is that the front of the house, we have a huge 15 tatami room with like Nirori. And this is kind of like next to the Genkan, yeah? So people come in, our guests come in, and we take them into this room. So we want to leave, we left that room as like the tatami Nirori room. It's beautiful, that's the receiving room. And next to it is kind of another tatami room, and then there's the Butsudan room. And we have left all of this as kind of the, the guest area, the tatami side. And in the back of the house, there was like a kitchen and a, a, a living room and another room and a very small room. And this room is, these three rooms we have renovated kind of into like our, our side, the, the family side of the house. Yeah? Um, it's worked out that everyone goes across the entire house, but that was the idea behind it. Okay? So uh, these three rooms we, we changed, yeah? we removed the department, we put, I, put, I, I did it, <laughs> I put insulation and I put Okay. So, when I removed the papami from the main living room, I made a discovery. What did I discover? I discovered a very, 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 very old in-floor, uh, floor seeking pattern. This is an in-floor pattern. Yeah? So, uh, this was never mentioned. Uh, a heated floor. Yeah? So, um, if you ever watch TV or something, normally they have the modern tables with a little heater underneath and the big blankets. You sit underneath, yeah, in the past, they didn't have such technology. They just had a cement pit. <laughs> and you heated that. Yeah, and you can put a table around it. Yeah? So uh, this is a remnant of really the old, old, old past. So uh, I, I discovered this. And if we wanted to, we could have kept this. We could have modernized it. We could have integrated it. But, you know, don't think that you have to maintain all traditions. Uh, it was just kind of in the way. <laughs> so, yeah. We, I, I just insulated and I, I put floor on top of this, yeah, so it's no longer used. But you can really discover things if you start just lifting up uh, old Um As uh, both of you mentioned, David at least did mention the newspapers he found. Often they put like old newspapers under the Dukhani, out keep it dry or something. So you can really discover some kind of gems under this. So uh, this is one thing I want to put on you can discover many things. Okay, so, uh, first project. Uh, walls. Okay, uh, the main room. 
Uh, we have a large uh, 15 Papani room and it's next to the game pan and uh, I want to keep in mind that these old houses don't have walls so if you have pictures you want to hang up, tough luck, uh, and drafts. Drafts are a very big problem in these old houses and really it's up to you to find solutions. So one way that I dealt with us, um, some drafts is I built two walls, very simple thing to do, you can learn it on YouTube. Uh, put two walls in, put insulations, and then uh, it's just plywood there. And I had a choice, I could have um, plastered it, plaster it, white plaster, and then it blends in with the rest of the house. It looks beautiful, it's a wall, or you can paint it. So uh, we painted, well we painted it, my wife's mother painted it, and uh, now we have uh, something like this. So this is one of the walls we have. Uh, we have like this. Yeah, so this is one of the walls you have. Uh, so anyone can paint it. Anyone can get a projector and project a picture on the wall and stencil over it. Anyone can do this kind of thing. You can do any kind of, uh, any kind of picture. This is the other wall we have. Um, and I mentioned in my uh, presentation yesterday that in Japan there are the seven gods of luck. And one of the gods is called Benzai Ken. It's the name of the Japanese god. And Benzai Ten is uh, an Indian god, it comes from India, that's the origin of it, and this is the origin of that god. So, when Japanese people enter our house, this is a great connection and a wonderful story for us to talk about. Yeah. So, this is something very easily anyone can renovate, anyone can build a wall, anyone can put a picture on, you can make the connection. Uh, so that's one. Uh, another one we have... Could you put the outside of the house? Yes, I do. I'll show you afterwards. I'll pull up. I'll pull up. Uh, okay, so the way that our house is, is the ground floor, there's kind of like a central room and then there's rooms all around it, yeah? So there's a central room, yeah? And in Japanese, uh, you call it like the naka, yeah? like the center, yeah? So uh, my wife had a very genius idea. Um, Kominkas are very cold in winter. Very, very cold in winter. And uh, in winter, when it's snowing, as it often does, we don't necessarily want to go outside. You kind of want to be inside where it's nice and warm and look out at the beautiful falling snow. So my wife decided we would like a like, garden inside the house. And maybe like, like a river, like a water. And then I think she also decided we could have some carp or some fish or inside. Okay? Now, uh, beyond me, I'm not going to put water inside the house. And I don't really want fish inside the house. So I didn't go that far, but we compromised, we found a middle way, and we designed something that could be a naka niwa, niwa meaning garden. That could be a central garden, okay? So this is something that everyone can build. Uh, we built... Here we go. So this one is literally, all I did was, I just took up the tatami, the and I had an empty, empty floor space, now, I divided it in half, yeah, and half of it, this right half here is just flooring. It's just basic flooring. I've done that multiple times before. It's very easy to do. And on the left-hand side, you see I built a bridge. And in between it, I just filled it with uh, the white stones you get from any hardware store. They're, they're everywhere. They're very cheap. Uh, painted the side red. It's walkable. Yes? I just want to add that... The initial idea was to get water, and these stones and zen resemble water. So that was the easy replacement for some people. Who yeah, so that was the compromise. <laughs> we got the water in the form of uh, like a zen theme. Yeah? So this is something that I don't think you will ever find a Japanese person doing inside their house, especially inside like an old traditional house like this. Like I think it is beyond their ability to conceive this kind of idea. They're restricted by their concept of what an old traditional house is and how these spaces are used, right? We don't have those restrictions. Yet you can imagine or dream anything. And if you can dream it and compromise a little bit, you can make it possible. So, uh, this is the Nakaniwa that we made here. Yeah? This is a great um, point of interest for anyone who comes to our house. Okay. Uh, and then just... Yeah. So it's just... Very, very basic, yeah? Um, all of this wood you can buy from the local hardware store. A uh, piece of advice, uh, most hardware stores have uh, K trucks that you can rent for free. And normally it's like uh, like an hour 
time slot. You don't have to, yeah? So you don't have to get a pay truck for yourself. You can have your own car. You can get these raw materials. You can borrow the truck, take it back to your house. Uh, it's cheap. It's affordable. Yeah, it's very doable. Another one. Um, talk about two minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Then I'll talk about some of the pains. Okay. Um, one thing with these bars, uh, they have a lot of uh, fake ceilings everywhere, fake ceilings, and uh, if you try and take the fake ceilings down, a lot of nonsense will come down, so please, you can, you can cheap out on like some materials, and you can cheap out on tools, but please cover yourself up, okay, because you have no idea what's going to come down, um, so like, literally this uh, ceiling, like I just cracked with a crowbar, and like I yanked it down, and after, as I began to yank it down, I started to see through and you could see these beams. And as I saw the beams, I started to discover the beauty that was hidden up. And I really want to tell you, like, if I zoom in here, you can literally see the chainsaw marks still left on all the beams. Hand tools. Hand tools. Oh, hand tools, yeah. Hand tools, yeah. Oh, my dreams, yeah. <laughs> dreams coming through here, yeah. And there's also, like, all the, uh, the writing and markings are still left on the wood, yeah. So... They spend a lot of time and beauty down below, but not necessarily so much up top. Okay, so uh, please be careful. Um, and uh, last one, very very quickly, a uh, garden. So um, we had we had a garden. We have a garden, and uh, I wanted to very quickly just put down some like uh, fake grass and I've got like, a barbecue set, and I had to manage all of this. But I made a big mistake. I didn't put the bottom on the barbecue. So all the coal fell through, and I burnt a giant hole in the damn garden <laughs> that I had finished laying the day before. So, uh, 24 hours. You, you can make huge mistakes, but I promise you, you can just cut them out, <laughs> and you can cover them up with a barbecue pit. I have made so many mistakes in my floors and walls, and I promise you, nobody can look at any of them and notice them. Yeah? Symbol of life. Make all your problems part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I promise you, I promise you, you can, uh, you can, you can do it. Okay, and just lastly, because you asked for a picture of the house, I don't know if I can get one. But very quickly. This is like the very first time we saw the house. And you found it through? Oh, so I found this through the Akia Bank. Mm -hmm. um, so when you go to an Akia Bank, every city normally has one, and they have different systems for how you can do it. But normally, you email them or call them up, and you um, you set like an appointment or something. You say, "I want to see this house," and they arrange. Uh, we just walked up to this house, and uh, like happened to meet someone locally, and they knew the owners, and then that day we sat down with them, and that's how the conversation started. So, you know, be yourself, you know, and, uh, and good luck. Thank you very much. Okay, our, our last speaker, uh, he spoke yesterday as well, uh, Brett Rasmussen, and uh, he was listed originally as others. Okay. So this is, this is our others. Doesn't have images, but such a wealth of knowledge of finding old houses and renovating to make them useful on Otika Island in Nagasaki. So we're so happy that you can join us, Brad, and enjoy listening to his insights. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, like Joy mentioned, uh, I was originally asked to join another panel, and then my name got put on this panel. And then I contacted Stuart, and he was like, well, but those two panels are at the same time. You can't be at both panels. And so, um, anyways, I, I just uh, happened to be here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate in this panel as well. So, but I don't have any slides presented, so we'll just talk and, and uh, do it that way. Um, I have been involved in a number of different uh, Minka renovation projects on Ojika Island, as, as Joy mentioned. Uh, that's where I originally uh, came to back in 2008 uh, and had did a little time going back and forth but uh, uh, altogether been there about 12 years and probably have had my hand in uh, at least 10 different renovation projects. I mean if you count all of the sort of smaller things then probably more than that but uh, my general 
uh, experiences in making unlivable minka into, min into livable minka. Because in the particular area that I'm at, uh, there are all kinds of empty houses, most of them minka, uh, but, and lots of people who want to move to the island and live there. It's a, a very beautiful place. It's listed as one of the most beautiful villages in Japan, if you're familiar with that uh, organization. Um, so there's people who want to move there, but they can't because there are not houses in livable condition, ready, you know, ready to move in. Uh, and because it's an island, it's hard for people to sort of make that jump um, into, a, into a house that they have to do all kinds of work before they can start living there. Um, so I have, uh, I started my process by um, moving into an unlivable condition, Minka, for free, uh, you know, talking to the owner, getting permission to live there for no rent, and then I fix up the Minka while living there, and as soon as it becomes sort of a livable condition uh, place, then I give that Minka back to the owner. He's then able to rent it out to someone because it's now it's, you know, it's in that condition where someone can move in. Uh, and then I move on to the next empty, unlivable house and repeat the same process. And when I originally started this, I didn't have uh, any sort of intimate knowledge of Japanese carpentry or or tsuchikabe, the earth walls, or or plumbing or electrical. I've had I had some basic basic knowledge from growing up on a farm and working with my dad, fixing tractors and you know doing just sort of handyman type stuff around the farm, but uh, no real intimate knowledge with, with Japanese um, stuff. And so I got that experience by moving from house to house, um, doing projects very unprofessionally in the beginning. So you know my first plastered walls were, you know, I mean, they're rough and, and kind of ugly to look at, but they got the job done. Uh, and that gave me the opportunity to sort of uh, have the freedom, because it was already an unlivable condition house, I could, I could pull walls apart and pull floors apart and look at how things were put together uh, and then gain a lot of experience uh, that way. And I, I really didn't then have to worry about if I really, you know, made, made a big mistake. It's, it was already unlivable, so... There was no loss there, um, but thankfully I was able to, to bring them all to a condition that, that were, uh, you know, of mutual benefit to both of us. I'm, I'm gaining knowledge and skills, and the owner is then, uh, in, re in return, receiving a house that they can then rent to, to someone and actually, you know, uh, benefit the community. So after I did that about five times, I had gained enough skills where I could do that as my, um, my sort of... Yeah, my, my income, that, that's what I primarily do as my, that's my, that's my life, that's my um, task these days. So my, my viewpoint then from, from the ability to find a Minka is usually through word of mouth. That's the way that I have primarily found my, uh, my uh, opportunities. And what I have found is that particularly depending on the community that you're looking at, I mean, mo most communities will have an Akia bank, and, and the island that I'm on has an Akia bank, um, but the percentage of houses that are actually listed there, as opposed to the percentage of houses that are actually empty and potentially available, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a tiny percentage is, is what's actually listed in the Akia Bank. So if you actually are able to get to the community, uh, and as some others have mentioned, make those connections, then it opens up a whole large world of, of other possibilities. And that's not to say that, that you know, the Akia Bank is bad or anything, it's just that that's, that's one option, and it's only sort of scratching the surface often in, in a lot of these areas. Um, so just kind of maybe keep that in mind. If there is the opportunity for you to spend some time and make connections in that community before you decide on a, a, a Minka, then that can be a, a really good way to go about it. And then that also allows you to get a sense of the community. Is this a is this a place that fits the kind of lifestyle that I'm interested in? Is this, you know, the, are there people that are interested in, you know, similar things to me? Uh, is this going to be a good, a good fit before I, before I actually move in there? Um, and then, of course, there are other, there are other solutions. There's not just this sort of town Akia banks. There's also Minka associations. Uh, there's the Japan uh, uh, JMRA. I can't remember what the, it's Nihon Minka Saisei Kyokai. They have a, a Minka bank as well, which is often, uh, most of them are sort of listed as, as being available to move to a different location, 
But oftentimes, if you actually contact the owner and, and see what the situation is, a lot of times you can actually, you know, they're, they're not necessarily aware that somebody would want to use the house on the land that it's already at. And so if you tell them, yes, I want to use it here, a lot, a lot of times that can actually be a, a possibility. The house is on the Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there are a number of other ways as well. Yeah, there, there are tax forfeitures, and, and there are a number of people who have, have uh, gone through that. I think, you know, the, the Tokyo Lama um, guy that maybe a lot of people have seen his YouTube page, I think that's the route that, that he took. So that's an option. There are also some difficulties that can be associated with, with going the, that route. Yeah, and of course, real estate. Uh, companies and there are a number of real estate companies that that specifically focus on sort of country life or kominka. And what I found is oftentimes, if you can get involved with one of those companies, that will be the best bet because they really understand the sort of uh, unique uh, circumstances that come with with country life and with buying a, a kominka. And, um, can often help you a lot more than than somebody who's you know, primarily dealing with, with apartment buildings or something and doesn't really know the, the or appreciate the, the intricacies of a, of a Minka. Um, and then, sorry, you have a question? Yeah, about the deals with the owners. Mm -hmm. um, so the deal was you, you can stay there for free, you renovate the place, mm -hmm. but then how much did you invest in all of them? Like uh, right, so, so my, my method of, of renovation is by using a lot of recycled materials. So I use almost exclusively recycled materials, to be honest with you. So whether it's the earth walls, I'm getting pulling earth walls out of other houses that have been demolished. I'm using reusing beams. I'm reusing just about everything that I can. So um, my Tell material... Tell about your warehouse. Yeah, I have... I, I, <laughs> so I rent now... I have several warehouses, actually. The one I had in the slideshow <laughs> is a... a a gymnasium from an abandoned elementary school that I'm renting for for 1,500 yen a year, <laughs> and it is now filled with with doors, you know, shoji, fusuma, uh, uh, hibachi. I mean, anything that that people are when they're tearing down a house, they'll give me a call now, and I, you know, like we're tearing it down now, and so I drop everything and go and get it and and store it in a warehouse. And I use all of these materials in the projects that I'm doing so that my material costs are, are ridiculously low. Um, and it's a way, you know, I was on the legacy of the Minka panel. It's a way of sort of maintaining the legacy of these places, reusing things that are already built. A lot of times they're of much better quality than, than you can find these days, or the materials are better. Um, so that's that's a, a really good way if you can get the materials already existing. I mean, why 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 make something new when you've already got a perfectly beautiful uh, thing that exists, and you can do a little bit of tweaking to it, maybe to, to make it fit in the uh, the location that you're at. So basically, the only thing you have to invest in is a truck and tools, right? Yeah, originally I didn't have a truck either because it's a small little island. Um, so I didn't really need a truck. Yeah, I, I started buying some tools, and and, uh, and most of those I got secondhand as well. So so really, my investments were were pretty low. Yeah, and even these days, my, my so I recently built a, a sauna, an addition addition on a, a, a bathhouse that was recently built on the island. Uh, my friend was starting and and, and uh, asked me to build the sauna there. And I did that with about 70% reused material, so it's, a, it's an earth-walled, traditional, traditionally built, uh, using traditional joinery with an earth-walled center, and, and the earth is all recycled, 70% of the beams are recycled, the floors, so um, it can become a really good option, but of course, you know, not, not everybody is, is going to be able to do that. It does require, you know, it, it, it came after many years of kind of doing this sort of um, project. But uh, yeah, one, one thing maybe that I would just briefly mention is that in these old houses, the renovation stage, the legacy of the Mika is not just the house itself, but of the skills that go along with maintaining, with building, maintaining, and restoring these houses. So some of you may know, and I mentioned this in my other, um, in my other presentation, is that those skills are also listed as UNESCO intangible world heritage um, artifacts and so it's if you have the opportunity to do things and and maybe hire a traditional craftsman or or redo the the tuchikabe or something just just know and I'm not saying that 
that you have to do it in every, you know, every, every individual case. But if you do, it's a very good way to help preserve these skills that, that are uh, involved with the, the building and maintaining these uh, places. So, so please, I would just encourage you to not just think of the house itself, but also all of the uh, connected cracks and materials. And there's so many, so many different uh, people involved in all of the different aspects of, of maintaining and building a Minka. Fantastic. Thank you so much. now for questions, but before that, I would love to get you guys to comment on, as you were listening to other people's presentations, anything you want to comment on about other people's presentations? I, I had one question for Brett. Um, so I have heard mostly through Minka Summit about Minka renovations in general throughout Japan, and it meant Nash was doing that. Uh, but I didn't know so much about Kyushu in particular. Um, now, I heard that you know Osaka Bampaku is coming, the World Fairs are, uh, I don't know how they the Bampaku is coming to Osaka, like a World's Fair type thing. Um, and, and in the late 1800s, they had one um, somewhere, I think it was Paris, but Japan had two booths. There was the Japan booth, and then there was the, the Kyushu booth, the Sasatasuma. It was a different country uh, presented. So are the building techniques used in Kyushu similar to what you see in Hanshu in these old Kaminka, or is it uh, pretty similar? I mean, uh, thanks for that question. And it's uh, different in all different areas of Japan. I, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's a, a Kyushu-specific building style. And even on, on the island where I'm located, it's, it's different from, from mainland. Uh, Kyushu, and, and a lot of that has to do with the, the different weather patterns, the different climates, the, whether it's by a mountain, you know, my, my, my uh, island obviously is surrounded by ocean and deals with typhoons a lot, um, and so you see a lot of different uh, individual quirks, and you even see it down to, like, so that all traditional Japanese houses had tsuchikabe, right? But the way that you tie the bamboo to the, to the nuki, to the frame on the inside, is different depending on the the place that you go to. So the the island that I'm at has a specific way of, of wrapping the the rope around the, the nuki before you start putting the first plaster on. And you find these different individual quirks uh, are different depending on where you go. So that's something that's as you're doing a renovation of your Mika to kind of keep an eye out for what are these sort of like uh, individual quirks of the of the location that your Mika is at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciated uh, what you had in your presentation, David, about uh, sort of the decision-making process of whether you want to take on a renovation of a main car or something like this. And I, I, I definitely share your your, sen your belief that you're not really buying a real estate asset or something when you're getting a main car, right? It's actually more of a money sink. So if you're going to have a fun time and gain, you know, uh, richness and value out of the process of renovating it or being part of the community in a meaningful way, then it's definitely a good choice. Uh, if you know, you're, you're wanting it to hold value over time, I don't know if that's necessarily the best uh, thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, but as you say, you're really buying into a social network, you're buying into a community, and that, that sort of being aware of that, that the building exists within a larger context is really important, I think. Yeah, I would maybe say, I mean, did Mark and, and uh, and the heck, uh, the the fragrance, uh, the beautiful fragrance. Um, Not smell. Yeah. Um, I would just say that the idea of putting the the nakaniwa in the house is definitely a, a unique one, and it sort of sparks something. For some reason, I had I've always had this dream of having water inside uh, inside my house as well, and so I think like making the dry. Like the you know yeah. the dry garden on the inside is a maybe an interesting way of incorporating water yeah. into the interior yeah. structure yeah. of the house. Pottery things like that, and it's got a system and it yeah, you goes through them. Yeah. 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 Has have anyone been to Naoshima? Yeah. Naoshima <laughs> has one of the art houses. Yeah. Has the beautiful goldfish yes. pond under the floor, so yeah. mm. there is a lot of creativity yes. in artists yeah. in Japan. New skills that yeah. are like, <laughs> like painted a goldfish pond on, 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 on the concrete um, outside in the patio area. She painted a goldfish oh, pond, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you yeah. can do it with yeah, resin as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Right yeah, you can do that. Mark, did you have anything? Yeah, I just yeah. want to talk about um, specifically this idea of getting uh, used materials. Houses are
are pulled down all the time and companies have to pay to get rid of the stuff. So you can just go up and be like, yo, can I take some of that stuff? And they were like, you want to save me money? You take it. <laughs> so this is a really, really good point. Yeah, the doors we just received. Oh yeah, oh, so I, did show, I didn't show you a picture, that's a shame. Yes, really so we have the old uh, cloth material doors, my doors, um, and uh, we, just, we just received 20 kind of like bamboo style summer doors for free from a friend because they were tearing the house down. So 20 doors! So we just changed all of our like Ingawa side garden side doors and the Nakaniwa doors are now all bamboo doors. So the, the, the view is just leveled up for free. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Any questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with like building codes and things like that? Because you've got criticisms like you yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you have there are rules and regulations and even about guidelines. On yeah. Stairs. Don't I tell know. anyone. It's inside. <laughs> you can't see. Yeah. I mean, be careful not to touch stuff when you break your house in one go. But like, if you're just putting a wall in, then it has no impact. Yeah. You're just going to do flooring. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing. Yeah. I mean, it, even, even the stuff that I'm doing where we're, we're tearing down parts of the building and, and completely redoing it, there's no permitting or anything. There are legal stuff you can't do, like electrical work. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, there and and laws are getting stricter. And I would just say that yeah. that now there are laws on the on uh, that have been re reintroduced in the last year or so that you can't do over a certain percentage of the structure uh, without getting a re-permit. And it also is going to depend on the location that you're at because there are zones in Japan. There are city planning zones and there are quasi city planning zones and there are outside planning zones. And so each of those have different laws and requirements associated with them and sometimes you need to apply for a permit some some areas you don't need to apply for a permit and with all of those the key thing to understand is that just because you don't have to apply for a permit in a certain area doesn't mean that you can do illegal construction i mean people do it but it's illegal and so you need to be aware of that whether you choose to do it or not is you know is up to you, but be aware that just because something doesn't require a permit does not mean that you can just build whatever you want according to the law. Yes. <laughs> I want to put a on my my no cheap my farmland in the area. I want to put a can't build on, on farmland. Yes. But then my real say you can say when I bought the place, um, build it anyway, and then if they ask you or challenge you, I just say, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, would you guys advise like hiring someone to help you? Do the planning. If, so the, the outside stuff is visible and people might complain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it's inside your house most of the time, as long as you're not destroying like a wall that's going to collapse your house. Yeah, I mean, Fred, Fred's answer is the best answer, I think. Definitely, you should listen to him. Um, I think uh, generally, you know, if you build something that is against the regulations, they'll come and tell you to take it down. That's the worst case scenario that could happen, right? Um, but uh, you definitely would want to be getting advice to make sure that you're not breaking any rules. Um, so I, I, again, I said I'm not taking any permits out, but I do have a, a local architect who I consult with when we're talking about how to do stuff, and he gives us advice. So he's not he's not doing permits for us. He's just giving us advice though, so we don't break any rules. So you do want to be careful. One thing that I would just like to add, and I mentioned this in the in the chat that I did with with uh, JJ online the other day, is that please watch it. <laughs> is dealing with asbestos. So I see a lot of people doing DIY mm -hmm. videos online and I see them coming in with their <laughs> sledgehammers and just mashing stuff apart with Way no masks, masks, no protection, Way nothing. Um, and I want to let you all know that just because something is a Komika and it was originally not built with like, you know, dangerous materials, it was all originally built with, with earth materials and stuff, a lot of the stuff that was added afterwards is almost guaranteed to have asbestos in it. So whether it's ceiling tiles or it's it's the uh, uh, wall panels, you know the the uh, what's the, I'm forgetting the word, but the you know if they if they redid the for example like a kitchen wall with fireproof panels around the area where the where the cook stove is, that is also 99% guaranteed to have asbestos in it. So don't don't just go around you know mashing up. Walls and, and think everything is going to be okay because um, there is asbestos in a lot of things. Japan had asbestos put into materials that were legally sellable 
until 2006. So even if it's a very recent addition or recent um, change to the house, it still might have asbestos in it, so be aware of that. And there are, there is one specific website, I can't, I, I mean, it's a long convoluted name, but there is a website that you can go to in Japanese if you know, like, so for, if you open up a wall and you can see the manufacturer of the material, you can enter that in and there's a database that will tell you whether it contains asbestos or not and what years did it contain it and um, be aware. And if you're not aware, then please ask a professional. And actually, the laws on that have gotten very strict in the last year or so uh, as far as needing to get your, your uh, building checked for asbestos before you do a lot of that demolition work. And you need to dispose of it carefully. Yeah, right? yeah. Disposal like, can also be a, a big mm -hmm. hassle as yeah. well. And yeah. There is no any subsidy about removing asbestos during renovation project process. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, unless you use a subsidy. You know, I mean, there are ways that you could use a subsidy not specifically for mm -hmm. asbestos mm -hmm. removal. You know, if you're getting a subsidy to do part of a renovation of, of the property, then you, that you could use it for asbestos. Mm -hmm. But there isn't like a specific. Asbestos removal subsidy, as far as I'm aware. I mean, talking about uh, hiring a professional before you buy a property, just to make sure it's not a huge money pit, is probably good advice too, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no. that's, that's... But, but things like finding a well, they can't check for everything, but they could check for basic things before you invest. Right? Yes. How to do like, sure. how to do that when I bought my place, and you know, you're trying to get someone in, you know, who's in Tokyo and getting keen and going through the real estate agent, check. I would hire, I mean, what we did is hire a, a re reform company, renovation mm -hmm. company, and they go with you through the house, and you're going to hire them to do some of the work anyway, so they're invested, and they give you really good advice. That's mm -hmm. what we did. Is mm -hmm. that kind of... Yeah, like I, um, I, I will say that the word of mouth, the power of word of mouth through that, like I have an architect friend that is from Kobe originally, but then moved to Yoshino. And she is just so passionate about, like, she's not performing any of this work herself. And she's working basically for free, like these, these peanuts. But basically, because I'm, I'm intending on using mostly people local to the area, and that gives them work. It's like they, they might not be doing it themselves, but they know who the right person to go to is. Yeah. So you, I think a lot of communities, that's a common thing. You'll find someone that knows, that if, even if they don't know, they, don't, they know the right person. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than, you know, Hiring a huge company that you find on Google or something, and you know, asking around is usually a good route for that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, with the um, TFA, um, do you have to apply for the residence uh, or residency or visa? Or I've heard cases where if you have the Japanese um, spouse, it you know, makes things a lot easier. Now, just for the right. national yeah. laws, you need nothing. And it wasn't until last year in autumn they, they informed me. I bought I bought my house in July, and they said just to let you know, if you intend on buying any additional land from October, uh, we're going to start checking what uh, someone's citizenship is. So they weren't even checking what country you were from, uh, legally like the legal requirements. So. And that being said, uh, even though you can buy the house without being a resident, um, one huge thing that uh, maybe everyone here tapped in, who has a mink has tapped into is Hojo Keen, the subsistence money and grant money. And a lot of these do have regu like regulations that you have to be, uh, your juminyo, your, your residency has to be, not a Japanese citizen, but you have to be a resident of that town living there full time. And if not, you don't get this huge wealth of assistance money that you'll get from like replacing windows or all, all kinds of different. Uh, there's, a, there's a rainbow projecting out there, um, and yeah. So being a resident out there, I would also advise getting someone to help with Japanese and legal paperwork. Yes, there's a there's a lot of things if you don't have the language, and even if you have the language, it's a lot of legalese. So I would hire someone yeah. as a go between. Uh, Sam's a translator. Maybe you have some good. <laughs> Good people to refer us to. Yes. I already, I already <laughs> did one D transfer. I don't know if I want to do another. One, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I have some contacts if anybody needs. Uh, any last questions? Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. That was great. That was great. Sun's rain.